Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining for this X talk. I'm Meredith Davies. I'm the project manager for educational systems and service on the residential team within open learning. Uh, so the residential team has been a resource for support for Canvas since it was rolled out to the Institute in 2020. We offer um, a variety of support in options. I have a calendar, for instance, that uh, you can schedule short 15 minute uh, time blocks with me to talk about any particular Canvas trouble you're having with tools and technology specifically. We also offer learning design consultations with uh, the learning engineer experts on our team. Our team supports lecture capture and the Lightboard Studio. And we are all uh, delighted to meet with instructors and to talk about teaching and learning. You can reach out to us at our open learning residential email address or via Canvas support. We work quite closely with ISNT, uh, ISNT's Canvas support group. So if you if it's easier to reach us that way, if it's an email you may have used, uh, you can do that and they will connect you with someone on our team. With us today uh, in the audience are Dr. Aaron Kessler and Lauren Totino, who are also part of the residential team. Oh, the electricity just went out briefly. <laughs> We're also part of the residential team. Um, and they are able to answer any questions you have in the chat. So if you, if anything comes up, please put your questions in the chat and they should be able to help you there. I'll pause along the way to see if there's anything that they want to raise to the group or any questions that um, should be kind of heard by everybody, but otherwise you can uh, stick those right in the chat. And I want to just give a special thank you to Lauren. She has been a huge help and um, provided a lot of the content and resources for this talk. But if there are any hiccups along the way, those are all my fault that reflects not, not at all on Lauren. Everything she did was wonderful. Okay. So today we are going to talk about a variety of Canvas tools. These tools have gone through MIT's contract review process, which includes reviews for security, student privacy, and accessibility. So you can feel confident in that when using these tools with your students. We have many tools to cover. So this is going to be a broad overview. We won't deep dive into any particular tools, but if something uh, strikes your fancy, if you think you might wanna try it out in your teaching, we can talk about it more. We all, as I mentioned, have time to meet with you and discuss how these tools can be applied to your particular teaching strategy and your context. So please do reach out. The tools we'll cover today fall into a few different categories. We'll start with utility tools. These are quite simple, but are going to make your Canvas experience a little bit easier and more convenient. We have a couple of video tools, Zoom and Panopto. Discussion and co collaboration tools. These include Poll Everywhere, Slack, Piazza, Canvas discussions, and Flipgrid. And an annotation tool called Perusal, as well as the new analytics in Canvas, which is an updated version of their previous analytics function. We won't get into MATLAB or Gradescope in this talk, although we do have Canvas integrations with those tools. As Molly mentioned at the beginning, there's going to be an additional X talk next month covering Canvas tools for assessments and uh, Gradescope will be discussed more in depth during that uh, talk. So please join us for that, if, especially if you're interested in Gradescope. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to uh, show you is where to find and enable these tools within Canvas. So I have my uh, Canvas course site open. We're already in my Canvas site here. And if I go to my navigation panel for this course, I can go to the course settings down here, click on that, and this brings me to my course details page. I don't know if there are any home improvement fans out there, but um, I really amused myself by using the tool time logo for this course site. So to find these tools and enable them in your Canvas site, most of them are available already on the navigation tab. So you'll find some of them down here in the area that is not visible to students yet. If you'd like to use them in your class, you would probably just want to drag them up to the visible uh, area here and click save. A couple of them are under this apps tab here. So this is where you can find and install Dropbox, Flipgrid, and the redirect tool. 
And once you have installed these, they will be added to that navigation tab and you'll be able to move them around your navigation like you would other Canvas tools. So if you want to install one of these, you'll just click on the name of it and it's going to ask you if you want to add the app. Mine's already installed. Okay, so I'm gonna go back home. Actually, we're gonna, I'm gonna come back into this section. So I'll just leave this open. Okay, so you can find the tools there. This is true for all of the tools we'll be talking about today, except for Poll Everywhere, which is a little bit of a more, um, has a few more steps for integrating. We have documentation about that on the Canvas Resources for Instructors page. So if you want to use that tool, uh, I would recommend re referencing that instruction also available in the uh, ISNT knowledge base. Okay, so let's get started. The first tools we'll talk about are the utility tools that I mentioned, and we'll start with the redirect tool. So I'm gonna just jump back into my course site here. And as I mentioned, we're in the settings. We're gonna go to the apps tab and this arrow indicates the redirect tool. This function is going to add a link to a, a site outside of your Canvas course to your course navigation. So if you have a website of your own or some other resource on the web that students are interacting with or referencing quite often, you may wanna just add a link to that in your navigation so that students have a really quick way to find that whenever they need it. So to install that link, uh, you're just going to click on the redirect tool image here and I already have it installed, but if you click add app, you can add um, a link to the site. So if you leave the name, it's gonna ask you now to input a name and a URL. If you leave the name as redirect tool, that's what's gonna show up on your navigation. So you wanna give it a meaningful name and then you would just add the URL there as well. So I have already added one to my uh, course site, but if I want, wanted to add another one, I might do the open learning residential newsletter archive, for instance, and I'll stick the um, URL in right here and then click add app. And that's gonna add that link right to my course navigation. I've already added this, so I'm just gonna hit close here. And you can see here, I have uh, that link on my course navigation. So when I click on that, it's gonna tell me that I can visit this URL in a new tab and clicking on it will open URL in a new tab. So that's pretty straightforward and easy. I actually, oh yeah, okay. So adding links. So the next slide or the next tool that we'll talk about is the Dropbox tool. This is a file storage tool, which you may have used, uh, but if you connect it with your Canvas course, then you can share files from your Dropbox anywhere in Canvas where you have access to the rich text editor. This includes announcements, assignments, discussions, pages, quizzes, and the syllabus. So if we look back at the Canvas site, uh, I'll go back home to my course outline here. On any page, I get, as I mentioned, you, that has that rich text editor, you can insert uh, files from Dropbox. So I've already started this page here and I'm just gonna edit it as if I were an instructor currently working on this on this page for my course. I've written all of this uh, text and now I have here, we're gonna get started by work, all working with this same example file to start with. So if I wanted to um, stick a file from my Dropbox in there, I would click on this plug icon. This is like indicating that it's an app that plugs into Canvas. So if I click on that, it's gonna show me that I have enabled Dropbox. This will open up my files within Dropbox and I can um, choose the file that I want here. And that's just gonna stick that file in where I uh, had highlighted the text. So again, pretty straightforward. This is nothing groundbreaking, but it might just make your life a little bit easier. That is saved. And so now when students click on this, it will open the file in Dropbox. This is helpful, especially if you have really large files that you need to share with students. Sometimes uh, those can cause, if you have them embedded directly within your Canvas course, they can cause the site to load slowly on that page. So um, it's, may be preferable in those cases to share via Dropbox instead of sticking it right into your Canvas course. Um, it can also help you cut back on any file storage issues you run into with Canvas. So we'll move on then to the video tools within Canvas. So we'll start with Zoom. 
Zoom is a video conferencing tool that I know you're all familiar with because we're all on Zoom right now. So easy peasy. Um, I just wanted to highlight a couple of things about Zoom within Canvas. I'm sorry, I'm just rearranging my window here. So um, the two the two points that I want to make about Zoom are that if you go to the Zoom application within Canvas and schedule your course meetings through this menu rather than schedule them through the app, the meetings will automatically sync with your Canvas course calendar, which is really convenient for students. Additionally, if you record your Zoom meetings, they will be stored within your Canvas site here. The second, oh, I wanted to make a note about this, that the person who schedules the meetings will be the primary host of the Zoom meeting. So if you are an instructor working with a TA or a staff member and you ask them to schedule your meetings within Canvas for you, that person will be the primary host. So they'll need to either make you a host or you may just choose to um, schedule them yourself to kind of save that hassle. The other note that I wanna make about Zoom is that you can integrate Zoom with Panopta, which is the next tool we'll be talking about. And if you set that up, then any of your Zoom recordings will automatically be shared with the Panopto tool as well. That's handy if you want to use some of the Panopto editing features that are more robust than what exists within the Zoom tool. Okay, so that gets us through Zoom. And our next tool for video is Panopto. Panopto is a video recording and editing tool. It can be used to record videos, like you speaking through your screen, re record your browser if you're giving a presentation or a demonstration, or you can upload previously recorded video to the Panopto tool. Um, along with the ability to trim and edit videos, Panopto has a couple of additional features like inserting quiz questions into videos or uh, adding notes to videos as well. And Panopto videos can be shared anywhere within Canvas that you see that rich text editor that we discussed before, or directly from the Panopto link in your Canvas course or via a link to the video directly. So I'm gonna jump back into my Canvas course and visit the Panopto tool here. And this is going to open up, this is, is going to show you all of the uh, Panopto tools or Panopto recordings that I have for this course. So I have um, done a little bit of editing to this video about the Faraday cage featuring friend of open learning, Krishna Rajagopal. Um, he is here presenting about, uh, about the use of a Faraday cage and I have stuck a quiz in here and it's started me where the quiz already, um, showing me the quiz already. But if I hit play here, I'm about 10 seconds behind, you'll see that when we hit the point in time where I, as the instructor, have stuck the quiz in, uh, the video is going to pause and ask the student to answer this quiz question. So this is a really helpful um, feature if you want to encourage your students to stop and reflect on the concepts that you're presenting in a video or maybe prompt them for what they should be paying attention for in the next part of the video. You can think of these quizzes, they're very low stakes. So it doesn't, I think quiz is maybe not even the best word for it. You might think of them as a reflection question or a checkpoint within your video. Uh, using frequent low stakes quizzing like this can help students reflect and realize what they don't actually understand from the video that they've been watching, or it can help them reinforce the learning that they, they've already obtained and, and reinforce what they do know. This feature also works very well with worked and faded examples or in any, any scenario where you're explaining a multi-step process and you want students to pause and make sure that they are understanding what you're talking about, um, maybe explain to themselves what principle is being applied here or why this strategy was used at this point um, in the example. If you have, any whiteboard videos, this is also a, a great way to incorporate reflection through those. So I'm just gonna I'll also mention here that you can add discussion notes to Panopto videos as well, or discussion points to Panopto videos as well, and notes. And those can be visible to um, 
your students when they're watching Panopto videos. So this is per, these are particularly useful if you're asking students to watch videos um, and come prepared for class time, maybe like in a flipped classroom model or something using those principles. Okay, so that wraps up our video tools. We will go ahead then to the discussion and collaboration tools within Canvas. This is gonna include Poll Everywhere, Slack, Piazza, Canvas discussions, and Flipgrid. Okay, so going back to, oh, actually I'm gonna start by going to my next slide. So we'll start with Poll Everywhere. Poll Everywhere is an online polling platform that can that allows students to vote via text, smartphone, or through their computer, and along with that from within a Canvas site. If you are an instructor setting up Poll Everywhere activity, Poll Everywhere activities, you'll do that directly on the Poll Everywhere website, but then those can be embedded and shared within Canvas so that the experience for students within Canvas is pretty um, seamless. The first step to setting up Poll Everywhere or to using Poll Everywhere at MIT is to request a presenter's license, and you only have to do that once. So, you know, excuse me, you need to request a presenter's license for each class that you're teaching. Um, Poll Everywhere does not have to be used within Canvas. It can be used as a standalone tool, but if you enable the Canvas integration, then your class roster for your Canvas site will be automatically synced with Poll Everywhere, which makes it really easy to share polls with that particular group of students. So I'm gonna show you what a Poll Everywhere poll looks like. Uh, I have set a couple up here in my Canvas site. One nice feature of Poll Everywhere is that it enables you to create anonymous polls, which is a great way to gather anonymous feedback from your course, maybe from your students in the course periodically uh, throughout the semester. So I have uh, just an example here of what that might look like. This is the um, this is the form that students will see when they're responding, and I can see here that no responses have been submitted yet. Uh, actually, I think it would always say that because it because it's um, anonymous, but this is the form that students would use to submit feedback. And once a poll has been made anonymous, it can't be unanonymized. So your students should have no concerns about you possibly as an instructor seeing what they may have said in their anonymous feedback. Um, and so the next poll that I set up is not an anonymous poll, but is the same style of poll. So this is Another great way to use the Poll Everywhere tool is to get feedback from your students about what concepts maybe they are struggling to understand in the course. Um, you could ask at the end of each course, each course meeting or each lecture for students to reflect on what, um, what concepts run clear for them or at the beginning of a class. And then you can take some time to revisit any of those concepts that students may still find are confusing. Okay, I'm just taking a look at my notes to see if there's anything that I've missed. Oh, I wanted to mention the types of uh, questions that Poll Everywhere supports. There is a huge variety. They can, you can choose from multiple choice, word cloud, open-ended, survey, clickable image. There's an emotional scale style of question. So, and the list goes on from there. So there's quite a lot of functionality within the Poll Everywhere tool. And then you as the instructor, can see on the Poll Everywhere website. Um, it shows you very clearly how students have responded. Uh, for the questions that are not anonymized, those responses are tied to the student's name. If you have synced your Canvas roster, if they are anonymized, then you will just see the responses without, um, of course, any student data shared there. Okay. So the next tool that we'll talk about is Slack. Slack is a messaging and collaboration tool. It's great for quick communications. You may think of it as a way to replace email and uh, it tends to have a more informal feel to it than some of the other discussion tools, which we will talk about like uh, the Canvas built-in discussions or Piazza. Similarly to Poll Everywhere, Slack can be used as a standalone app, but enabling the Canvas integration will sync your class roster with your Slack workspace. This is super handy if you have a large class, otherwise you'll have to invite each student individually to your Slack workspace. Um, you can also 
request an additional workspace if you want to have a workspace for your course team, maybe you and other instructors and staff who you collaborate with to have one workspace that is lasts from year to year rather than the workspace created for a class each semester. So if you want something like that, you can request it through ISMT. We won't spend too much time on Slack because there was actually an X talk focused entirely on Slack, which I have linked to in my slides. I'll share these slides at the end of the presentation. So if you're interested in Slack, you can spend some time with that X talk. Typically, you would run Slack as an app out outside of the browser, but I've just um, enabled it in my browser window here to take a look at what the Slack interface looks like. So you can see here that there are several different channels over here and Slack enables discussions that can be public to the whole class. They can be private groups or they can be one-on-one -on -one discussions. Students can also use Slack to share files. They can share GIFs slash GIFs, depending on what you prefer, um, to, to um, enhance their responses and they can react through emojis. Slack enables video recordings and audio recordings. So there's a pretty robust feature set within the Slack tool itself. And students really like this tool. Um, many of them use it outside of, of the classroom. So it's something that a lot of students are familiar with. Okay, our next tool is Piazza. Piazza is a wiki style discussion forum. So unlike a more traditional discussion forum that threads responses to a topic, in, within Piazza, students are collaborating together to come up with the best answer to a discussion question posted by the instructor or by another student. Additionally, in addition to the student's answer, the instructor can post an answer um, to help clarify anything that maybe the students missed, but it is a pretty collaborative discussion board option. St instructors can also endorse the student's response to show that that is a good answer and Piazza provides support for real-time polling, which is pretty handy. So I, again, have a Piazza discussion set up in my course site here, which I will open up and you can see what Piazza looks like within Canvas. So uh, I can see here that there are a few different posts with, within my course site and the ones that were made by me as the instructor are marked here in yellow, which is really handy that students can pretty quickly see what came from the instructor versus what has come from other students. If I look at this question, um, the student has, has posed, a student has posted this question to the discussion board and then a couple of other students here, you can see have collaborated to update this answer and um, help their peer. I also, as the instructor, endorse this answer and think that it's great and uh, the students have figured it out together. So Piazza is really great for collaborative learning and getting students to interact with each other. Um, it's also handy, of course, that the instructor can still provide feedback to students by endorsing a student's post or adding their own answer. Another nice feature of the Piazza tool is that students can post anonymously. This is nice for students who may have some anxiety about posting questions about topics that they don't aren't sure about or don't don't know. Um, it just makes that whole process a little bit easier. Piazza su provides support for formatting equations using LaTeX and um, editing computer code as well. So it's a pretty flexible for various um, top, or various subject matter uh, types at MIT. Okay, so I think that will do it for Piazza. Uh, the next tool that we will talk about is the Canvas discussions tool. I know this is a lot of discussion tools, but we're getting close to the end of discussion tools. So the Canvas discussions are the native discussion feature built into Canvas. The Canvas discussions are a threaded style discussion, which um, is probably what you're more familiar with compared to Piazza. And an additional feature within the Canvas discussions is that they can function as a graded assignment and include a peer review component. So we can take a look at what that can look like. I'll open up my, oh, my discussions are over here. I'll open up my Canvas discussions. 
And this is the uh, discussion board with, with many discussions on it, um, or that could have many discussion topics on it. I have set up just a few discussions for the first week of my class. Uh, I set up one topic here for questions and comments about the course structure and syllabus. So I would let this persist throughout the duration of the semester in case anything came up. Um, you could also have, you could think about structuring discussions so that students have a place to ask questions broadly about the unit that you're covering and then maybe more specified discussion topics for students to share work about work on an, a specific homework problem or a topic or answer or reflect on a specific question. So I'll show you what a discussion, what an individual discussion looks like. I've made this one graded, which again, is really easy within Canvas. Uh, I, as the instructor, have posted uh, a prompt here to ask students to share their uh, first visualizations and my students started responding. So. Um, this is what the discussion looks like. The thing I kind of wanted to highlight here is that this is my post here as an instructor. You can see that it doesn't show up any differently than the student post. So that is just something to watch out for when you're using the Canvas discussions. Um, it doesn't highlight this, the instructor's posts the same way that the Piazza tool does. This, uh, so as I mentioned, Canvas discussions can be created as a graded assignment. And that particular feature will be discussed more at the Canvas assessments X talk. So if that's something that you're interested in using, um, again, please tune in for that. One question that we get frequently is how do I decide between using Canvas discussions and using Piazza or Slack even as a replacement for either one of those discussion tools? And the answer that I hate to give is that it really depends on your course context and what you need out of the tool. I just say that I hate to give that because I know it's somewhat unsatisfying, but both tools are great, or all three, really. Um, we have some evidence that students seem to be engaged more with Slack and Piazza versus Canvas. Slack and Piazza are both a bit more modern compared to the Canvas discussions. Um, and students may be familiar with them from context outside of Canvas. Piazza is used by uh, some of the large GIR classes at MIT, so lots of students have used can uh, Piazza and may have an affinity for it because of that. And the same with Slack. Um, Slack is used well beyond um, just an educational setting. So it really depends on what you want from the tool and what you need. A benefit to using the Canvas discussions is that they're already here within Canvas. It's not another tool that your students have to learn. And you can use some of those additional Canvas features like making it graded and adding a peer review component. If you are trying to decide which one to use and you need some guidance or some help making that decision, that's something that we are happy to talk to you about. But it's ultimately kind of like getting around Boston. You might prefer to take the T, it's kind of the zippiest way, but if you wanna take the bus, that's totally fine. And the bus can get you places where the T can't. So it really, um, you can't totally go wrong. Okay, so the next tool we will see here is Flipgrid. Flipgrid could have gone in the video section, but it's actually a discussion tool that replaces traditional text-based discussions with threaded video discussions. Um, a grid is a video discussion board. Flipgrid is a very lightweight video creation process. It's good for short, spontaneous videos, or just, uh, it doesn't have to be spontaneous, but shorter videos that maybe are less formal than a, a recording you might do with Zoom or Panopto. Just need a drink of water. Okay, so um, students may recognize some of the features within Flipgrid are similar to social media video platforms that they've used. Within Flipgrid, you can add text to your videos, you can change the background, add stickers, that kind of thing. So it has some additional like fun features to it. And it does function just like a discussion board. So um, I will actually, will just open up my Flipgrid uh, course item here. I have set up one Flipgrid discussion so far, asking my students to introduce themselves so that we can start to get to know each other before the class 
uh, begins. So I, as the instructor, have posted this video introducing students to the topic of this discussion and modeling what I would like to get from them. And I have a couple of students who've already responded. Uh, you can see, I'll, we'll take a look at Lauren's here. It's gonna start playing. Uh, Lauren has posted her video here, letting us know her name and her first job that she ever held. And you can see that if I scroll further down on the page, my other uh, A plus student, Erin, has responded. And this is how uh, the discussion can get going. Um, students can post their own posts responding to the instructor's post, or they can post responses to other students, other students posts, just like a discussion board that you're familiar with. So um, I'll just go out of here so that nobody has to sit with their face giant on the screen while I talk a little bit more about Flipgrid. Um, so it's really easy using Flipgrid for students to see each other's videos, which is different than some of the other ways that you might ask students to share video within Canvas. If they're submitting video that they've recorded for example, to an assignment, that's only going to be between the instructor and the student, and the rest of the students don't necessarily see that. So Flipgrid is a great way to kind of get students looking at each other's videos and hearing each other's voices uh, that way. It's been a popular tool within global languages for students to practice speaking foreign languages and uh, speaking to each other in foreign languages. But beyond that use case, you could also ask students to explain how they worked out a problem, explain maybe you could break one large topic into, or one large concept into multiple mini topics and ask, ask each student to explain a different topic and have students respond that way. Um, and since this tool is great for short videos, it's a good way for students to practice summarizing, synthesizing, and distilling ideas and sharing them that way. If you have students who are uncomfortable recording videos, having their having their um, just uncomfortable on video in general, you could offer them the option to put an image there instead and just share an audio recording. Uh, it is a great way to foster rich connections within Canvas. And again, you could you could think about using it in advance of the um, time that your course starts to help students get to know each other um, that way ahead ahead of the ahead of the curve. Okay, so that does it for our discussion questions. And again, I'll just take a pause here and see if there are any questions that or comments that Erin and Lauren want to share with the group. Hey, Meredith, a question that came up that's a, a good one that you kind of you talked about a little bit, but may lead to the discussion in the next X talk is, you know, which of these are able to be graded or connected with the gradebook? Are they all able to, or are only certain certain ones of these connected with, with the gradebook feature? So uh, from this list, the Flipgrid can be connected to the gradebook. It integrates with the speed grader tool. So if you set up a Flipgrid assignment, um, instructor, you as the instructor then can quickly go through each student and it will show you all of the videos that they've contributed to that assignment discussion assignment. So both their post um, to the discussion and then any post that they've made to their peers. Uh, Canvas discussions can be set up as a discussion or as a graded um, assignment. Piazza cannot be connected. There's no grading feature within Piazza at all. It, um, and so there's no, there's not one that connects to Canvas. If you wanted to give students grades based on their Piazza participation, that would be a more manual um, job by the instructor to kind of comb through and see how students are responding. I don't believe there is any kind of functionality within Slack for grading, although I haven't looked into that, but I would say I feel pretty confident that that does not exist. And for Poll Everywhere, um, I am actually not sure if that can be connected back to Canvas for grading. I don't know, Aaron or Lauren, if either of you has the answer to that, but I can get back to uh, the person who has asked that question about Poll Everywhere specifically. Um, I don't believe that you can do grading with Poll Everywhere. So it's like Slack in that regard. Okay. Yeah, I think Poll Everywhere is meant to be uh, 
not meant for graded assessments. It's, it's just not something that they took into consideration when designing it. So of this list, uh, if you want to do a graded discussion, Flipgrid or Canvas discussions are your best options, or at least they'll be the easiest. Okay. So we are now on to annotation tool. We have um, enabled an annotation tool within Canvas called Perusal. Um, so Perusal is an online collaborative annotation tool that instructors and students can use. Um, I think that I will show Perusal first and then we'll talk through more of the functionality because it's um, a little bit, I think, harder to conceptualize uh, without seeing it. So I'm going to go back to my Canvas course site here. And um, I have just set up Perusal. I can access Perusal through the Perusal link here. If I were setting it up as an assignment for students, they could also access it through the list of assignments in the course. But I'm going to click on the Perusal link, and this is going to take me to the Perusal app. So the first thing that it's showing me here is an assignment that I've created. But as an instructor, um, I would start by adding content to my library. If I click on the library tab, you can see the content that I've added to the library for this course site. Excuse me. So Perusal uh, supports a huge variety of content types from text, images, videos, podcasts, etc. And then you can put those together into an assignment and ask students to read them and annotate them alongside each other. Students can then also respond to each other's annotations. Um, and you as the instructor can do that as well. So you can get in there and add comments to the other students' annotations, to your students' annotations as well. So if I go to an assignment uh, here, you can see that I've set one up covering um, the SEM micrograph technology that I learned about as an undergrad <laughs> studying material science. So if you see my parents, please let them know that I am putting my engineering degree to good use here. So I'm gonna open this assignment and it's gonna start with this video that I've asked students to watch that talks about um, beautiful chemistry, but you can see down here that there are four more parts to this assignment. So uh, student, students can start by watching this video and adding their comments here. And if I click on uh, the in here to expand the conversation, I'll see the comments that students have left on this video. If they had responded to each other, there would be additional comments um, building off of this student's comment here. So the next part of the assignment um, is asking students to read this document that covers some tips for improving image quality using the scanning electron microscope. And I can see here that a student has commented um, or made an annotation on this part of the document because it's highlighted. If I click on it, it's gonna pull up that, uh, that comment. The next thing that I have asked students to do is reflect on a few SEM images and share what is good about them or what could be better um, with each with each of these images based on the knowledge that they've gained from watching the video and reading the document. Um, this particular image is a, a micrograph of asbestos, as in we're all here learning these Canvas tools as best as we can. <laughs> I did not put this image in just so I could make that joke, but once I thought of it, I truly could not resist. And I said it in my practice uh, when I was running through this with Lauren. So um, again, if anybody out there is in material science, you're welcome to use that in your class. Okay, so here in this image, I can see that a student has made a comment on this particular part of the image, and this is gonna pull up their comment, um, and then students can respond in line here. So this is kind of like the big overview of how Perusal works, but there's lots of great functionality within this tool. And I don't want my bad humor to overshadow um, what a great, wonderful, or distract from what a great and wonderful tool this is. So let's talk about some of the great features of Perusal. Uh, so we saw that it supports a range of annotation types that instructors can choose from. Students and instructors can also upvote each other's annotations. So you can see kind of what is popular with your students. Annotations within Perusal support the use of hashtags. So you can, as the instructor can set up hashtags or allow your students to contribute hashtags. And then 
you can see throughout the semester how uh, these topics are, um, how students are interpreting these topics on, on different topic or in different scenarios throughout the semester. There's also a private notes feature within perusal so students can make notes to themselves before they share them with their, their peers or um, choose not to share them with their peers, but they can still annotate things that are private for themselves. And then a great thing about perusal is that you as the instructor can decide how involved you want to be. You might set up uh, some discussions at the beginning where you are really guiding and framing the discussion with a lot of question asking and responding to the students and kind of getting the ball rolling. But as students get to know the tool better, you can take a step back and really let students drive the, the uh, topics that come up during the annotation process and see what is um, inspiring them, sparking their interest and, and let them really bring themselves to, uh, to the discussion that way. Um, there is a grading component to perusal if you are interested in using that. It can sync back to your Canvas course. Perusal will apply a grading scheme by default when you create an assignment in it. Uh, it can be disabled. There's, an, there's auto grading within perusal, but um, we have found, or, or I should say broadly, the perusal community has found that students are able to sometimes game that auto grading feature. And our students at MIT just might be able to figure out how to do that. So it's something to consider if you're thinking about using the auto grading within perusal. If you want to talk more about using grading within perusal, um, our team has developed, well, Lauren and Erin, I should say specifically, have developed a guide for grading within perusal that could be really helpful there. Um, the, so anecdotally from our instructors who've used perusal, they have found that it helps students feel prepared for class and kind of cuts down on that awkward silence problem that can come up during class because students have already been engaging with each other and with the text and media for the class um, ahead of time. It also gives students who may be hesitant to respond in class a chance to uh, contribute their voices to the discussion within the uh, annotation time. We've heard positive feedback from students about using perusal um, in their course sites. And this, it, this particular tool is quite flexible and has been used from um, global languages and uh, humanities all the way to um, math classes where Tate worked examples. So there is a huge, a, a very broad, uh, variety of ways to apply this tool to your goals and your your classwork that again our team would be happy to talk to you about and help you brainstorm some ideas for that. Okay. Any questions about perusal? All right, I'm gonna this is our last thing. So we're the we're almost at the end here. We're gonna talk about analytics. So Canvas updated their analytics tool recently and it's much better than the analytics tool you may have seen in 2020 when Canvas was first rolled out to the Institute. It's more user-friendly and more helpful. So all across the board better. So I'll just um, very quickly show you what that looks like. This again is built right into Canvas. So um, it should be enabled on your course. So if I click on the new analytics feature, this is gonna show me quickly the average course grade for my course and the um, average grade on each assignment in the course. I can compare how one student is doing um, compared to the rest of the course here. Or if I had multiple sections, I could see how one section is doing compared to the entire course or um, how one section compares to another section. Additionally, if I want to look at the data for one individual assignment, I can click on that assignment and it's going to show me the high and low scores, the distribution of students across um, the, the graph here and the average grade. I can also very quickly message students who may be missing or late, maybe missing or have turned this assignment in late. Um, if I actually don't have any students who are missing or late, I have all great students in my class, but if I did, the, their email, email addresses would be automatically populated to this um, BCC list here. Then I can kind of find out what's happening. 
uh, or I can decide a specific threshold that I, if students have fallen below, I may want to message them and just um, talk about what's going on. So uh, that is a pretty handy feature within the new analytics. This information, some of it can also be generated as a report. So if you want to see a quick list of all of the late assignments, throughout the entire course um, or all the missing assignments, et cetera, that can be generated uh, on the reports tab within the new analytics tool. Okay, so if are there any questions on new analytics? Great, okay, well, that was our last tool to cover. So um, I've included in the slides some links to more resources if you haven't gotten enough today, there's plenty more to explore and as I've said, many times, please reach out to us. We are also happy to talk to you about any of these tools or um, anything in general with Canvas. Maybe you decide you didn't want to use any of these, but you still want to revisit your Canvas course des site design. We're happy to have those discussions as well. So thank you all for coming.